Welcome. Uh, my name is Femi Cadmus, um, law librarian and professor of law here at Yale Law School. And I'm so pleased to welcome you to um, a second in person. Is it? No, this is our first in person book talk. So we have not been doing book talks in person since COVID. So this is great that you're in this room. It's actually a hybrid talk, as I mentioned. We have um, uh, attendees who are on joining us by webinar by Zoom. But I'm so pleased that you're here today because we're going to have a discussion about an amazing book um, written by our very own Paul Pan, who's the Robert W. Winner Professor of Law and the Humanities and Director of the Oville Shell Junior Center for International Human Rights here at Yale School. Um, Professor Kahn teaches in the areas of constitutional law, theory, international law, cultural theory, and philosophy. He earned his BA from the University of Chicago and his PhD in philosophy and JD from Yale. Now, before coming to Yale, he's not always been at Yale, obviously. Uh, he clerked for Justice White in the United States Supreme Court and practiced law in Washington, D.C., during which time he was on the legal team representing Nicaragua before the International Court of Justice. He's the author of so many books, and his latest book today, we are privileged to have him as the author discussing this book, um, is Testimony. And I was telling him, I looked at the reviews, it's just superlative, it's just, it's been described in reviews as remarkable, unique, riveting, and intriguing, and also brave. So it is a brave, if you haven't read the book, you really need to read the book. It's a very brave um, um, narrative. And it's a book that you find everywhere. I always like to see where books travel. That's my hobby. I want to see which libraries have carried this book. So you'll go to Ecuador. You'll find the book in Ecuador. It's in the United Arab Emirates. Um, I found it in Nigeria. It's all over the world. So it's having this major global impact. So really pleased and really privileged to have um, Paul Ken here and share um, and give us some insight into the writing of his book. Now I'm going to go to a commentator today who's going to provide us some commentary. And uh, everybody knows Linda Greenhouse. Uh, she's a clinical lecturer in law and a senior research scholar here at Yale. She covered the Supreme Court for the New York Times between 1978 and 2008 and continues, you'll see that she's always appearing in media to write regularly for the newspaper's opinion pages. Professor Greenhouse has received several major journalism awards during her 40 year illustrious career at the Times, including the Pulitzer in 1998 and the Goldsmith Career Award for Excellence in Journalism from Harvard. She has written many books and uh, her books include a biography of Justice Harry Blackmon and her latest book is Justice on the Brink, The Death of Ruth Bader Ginsburg and the rise of Amy Coney Barrett. She is a graduate of Radcliffe College, Harvard, and earned a Master of Studies in Law degree from Yale Law School, and also has been awarded 13, think about that, 13 honorary degrees. So we're really pleased and very privileged also to have her in this room. So I'm going to hand it over to uh, Paula Linder. Okay, so the way we arrange this is, Paul's gonna say a few, or maybe more than a few words about uh, th this uh, highly unusual project. Uh, if if you think you know Professor Paul Kahn, you don't until you've read this. Um, it's, it's, uh, and then you may not want to. <laughs> <laughs> it's revelatory. Um, uh, well, I'll just say uh, it has four chapters, and the titles of those chapters will give you perhaps a clue as to the dimension of what takes place in this rather small book, Truth, Memory, Death, and Faith. Paul, over to you. Uh, well, thanks for uh, all the, the kind words. Uh, I, I was uh, actually surprised and delighted to hear the being read around the world. Uh, that is, I, 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 didn't, I didn't know all, all of that. And, and, and a word of warning, I guess, about um, re reading the book, although, of course, I encourage you to read the book, but. But any number of people have told me that um, they read my book, they couldn't put it down, which is great, and they regret having read it. <laughs> um, so it's a mixed bag. Um, so I don't want to take too much time. I, I, I thought, I, I assume most of you have not read the book, so I thought the most useful thing I could do would be uh, to describe uh, 
the storyline of the book, and, and then the more complex uh, narrative uh, line of the book, and then say a couple of words, a little bit about you know my ambitions in writing the book uh, and um, why um, it, it's not quite as um, unique in my corpus as Linda suggests that there are um, substantial ways of understanding the continuity between this book and uh, what I've been doing in at least some of my uh, other other work. So, so let me uh, begin with uh, just the shape of, of, of the book. Um, and uh, again, I'm assuming you haven't read it. So, so the book uh, begins with um, uh, my mother's uh, confession to my father on his her 75th birthday. Uh, and um, uh, so she confesses to an affair uh, that took place some 30 years earlier. Um, uh, and I explore, you know, what might have been the reasons on a kind of superficial level for her to do this and, and, and think about what drives people, um, uh, at least drove, drove her to think that truth, truth is a primary virtue. Uh, and, and that she and my father should live out their final years in uh, the warm glow of reconciliation and recognition uh, uh, that would come after this uh, confession. Uh, she imagined uh, you know, heart to heart talks and, uh, and, and um, a new affirmation of their long you know, 50 year um, uh, marriage. Um, so the first chapter is about truth. Uh, and and, um, and uh, she doesn't get what she imagined. Uh, what she gets is rage, unrelenting rage. Rage um, uh, that uh, blends into what can only be described as torture. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, so a war opens up between the two of them. Uh, and it's a very public war. Uh, it radiates out uh, in all that they do, everybody who knows them. Um, and, the, and the character of this war um, is that uh, my father, um, I don't want to repeat the language he, he uses, but my father's unrelenting in, in his attacks on her. And my mother is unrelenting in not yielding. She continually ref uh, comes back at him with, but I was lonely. Uh, as, as she describes the reasons uh, uh, for for the affair, uh, and uh, and, uh, and this goes on destroying their uh, all their relationships with others, destroying um, their uh, internal life, uh, and um, uh, uh, radiating, as I say, uh, 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 pain. Um, second chapter um, then is about memory. Um, what's going on here? Um, and, uh, and, and here I, uh, I take this uh, to reflect upon, the first chapter is more or less about my mother, the second chapter is more or less about my father. Uh, and the second, uh, as the first chapter begins with on, on my mother's 70th first, fifth birthday, she confessed. The second chapter begins with my father had a post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, and uh, this is a reflection on, on the nature of memory and memories pathology. Um, uh, and so one form of memories pathology is forgetting something I'm acutely aware of uh, as I get older. <laughs> but a second form of memories pathology is an inability to forget, a complete preoccupation, an occupying of the mind, um, uh, that can't drive it out of your mind. And, and so my father um, uh, uh, is traumatized by my mother's uh, confession uh, and, and can't get it out of his mind. It becomes all consuming. All he can see is my, my mother in bed with her a lover of 30 uh, years uh, earlier. Um, so those are the first two chapters, truth and memory. And I'll, I'll come back to <laughs> the, the deeper meaning of these chapters in, in, in a minute. The third, third chapter, um, uh, it begins in the, in the middle of this uh, traumatic war between my parents. Um, my mother starts dying. She's diagnosed with cancer. This is about two, 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 two and a half years uh, in, in, into this. Um, and this puts um, a tremendous, um, uh, what you call it, uh, a burden uh, on this relationship because although my father is raging and unforgiving, he's got to take care of it. Uh, and uh, uh, so uh, the tension here between, um, well, kind of a larger theme throughout the book between a love and evil it, it, it is acute. So um, this chapter uh, follows you know, uh, uh, 
But there's a way in, in which there's two parallel worlds out there. There's the world of our ordinary lives, and then there's the world of medical care and hospitals, um, and, which is its own world. And, 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 and the, the movement between these is a kind of follow from one into the other. Uh, and my mother falls in, into that world. Uh, and um, uh, so, uh, and, and she, um, you know, she declines very, very quickly uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, dies of um, uh, lymphoma. Uh, uh, so this is an opportunity to reflect about um, uh, how we deal uh, with death and how the family deals with death. Uh, and then the, the, the third, and the fourth and final chapter, I'll say another word about that, uh, is about faith, but it's really about ritual. Um, how, how does a family that is not uh, religious in any ordinary sense belongs to no um, organized religion? Uh, and, and one of the themes of the book is my, my father's irreligiosity. Uh, I call him an evangelical atheist. Uh, and, uh, 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 but still, there is the burden uh, of, of dealing with the fact of death. Uh, uh, and, uh, and, and of course, my father is still raging at my mother. Uh, uh, justice hasn't been done. She's died too soon because he's not done um, with uh, you know, the, the en endless program of torture that he had imagined. Um, so the, the final chapter is about um, the, the possibilities of faith in a secular age uh, and how ritual operates, uh, can operate, what I call invented ritual. Uh, and what does it do? Um, so that's the main narrative of the book. And that's a book I actually wrote in about 2009, 2010. Um, and, uh, and as I wrote it several years after my mother died. Uh, and then I took that book uh, and put it on my desk and left it. Uh, uh, because I wouldn't publish it as long, I used to say, as long as my father can read it, I won't publish it. Uh, because it, in many ways it's very hard on my father. Um, although, you know, uh, I do think I try and be sympathetic to him. Um, um, but it's difficult, uh, I must say. It's a difficult burden. Um, and then my father died in uh, 2018. Uh, and I started uh, thinking about publication of the book in 2018. And, and at the editor's uh, suggestion, uh, with my somewhat reluctance, I wrote a coda. What happened? The editor said, people will want to know what happened afterwards. Um, and uh, I wasn't sure about this, and I'm still not sure about this, because one of, one of the things I'm trying to do in the book, forget the coda for a moment, um, it is uh, write an aesthetically complete object, a complete, uh, an aesthetically complete uh, a narrative. Uh, an aesthetically complete narrative has a beginning, a middle, and an end. Uh, and I think the book has a beginning, a middle, and an end. But then it's got this coda. Uh, uh, and the coda really shifts perspective uh, on the whole thing because uh, in the book part, I'm, narr I'm, I'm testifying. I'm narrating what, what's going on. What am I seeing? What does it all this mean? Uh, in the coda, I'm uh, a subject because my father shifts his fury from my mother to me. And, and so the coda is about my discovering myself in that same place of you know, torture victim uh, and trying to deal with it uh, without abandoning my father, um, as many suggested I should. But how do you reconcile you know, obligations of care uh, and this Im immense victim that you're experiencing? Um, so I don't know, you know, the editor said, you know, you think this book's about your, pay, uh, about your parents, but people read this book and they think it's about you and they want to know. Uh, so I, I, I don't know, I ask people who read it what they think of the code and, and to me, it's still a little, a little dissident. So I, I, I don't know if it belongs or not. Okay, so that's the storyline of the book. Let me say a little bit now about the narrative line, the deeper narrative line as I understood it, because this, this, is, this is, as Linda said, this is a short book, but it is, a, in my view, it's immensely complicated immensely complex because it's taking up a lot of issues. Um, it's doing a lot of things. Um, so I wanted to write, I wanted to write, obviously I wanted to write a, a narrative about my parents uh, because I thought I was on the edge of something 
of vast significance here, but not a vast significance because it was extraordinary, but because <clears throat> in some ways it was ordinary. Uh, this is the way the, the depth and complexity the families can have. Uh, so I wanted to do justice uh, to that. Uh, I wanted to write a philosophical book. Um, uh, the book, in my view, is, is, is a, a work in philosophy. Uh, and, and this is one of the connections it has with my other, other work. Uh, you know, I've, I have experimented over the years with different genres. And so this is another genre memoir. Uh, uh, but the themes are common in, in some way for to my, my other work, love, justice, uh, death, torture, evil. These, these are violence. These are things I've been writing about for, for a long time and we can talk more about it, the relationship between micro and, 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 and macro. Um, uh, I wanted to write a, a religious book, uh, a religious book for a secular age. Um, so this book is about my own struggle with, with faith and what can faith look like to the non-believer. Uh, uh, theologians love this book, some of those comments. A lot of those comments are, are from theologians. Interestingly, um, Jewish theologians, Catholic theologians, and Protestant theologians all have the same reaction to this book. Uh, psychoanalysts love this book as well, by the way. <laughs> to which I would say, my, my, my daughter, who was going to see a, a, a psychiatrist of some sort, or no, actually it wasn't that. She was talking to a friend of hers uh, who is a, a psychiatrist, and her friend suggested, well, you don't really need to, to go. You can just send the psychiatrist this book. <laughs> 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 um, so, uh, but they like the book um, uh, too. Um, but I, uh, uh, so, so it's it's working at many many, many uh, levels. Now, uh, my own view uh, is it's a book about the twentieth century, uh, and um, uh, my parents are representative characters of the twentieth century and the destructive character of the twentieth century, um, and and it kind of splits. The first two chapters are are sort of about a philosophical reflection on the history of the 20th century. My mother is a, 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 a you know a, a refugee from Hitler's Germany. She comes here when she's 11 years old. Um, she speaks no English, uh, and um, and um, I characterize her as somebody who who is uh, always engaged in conversation. Uh, this is her way of creating the world. Uh, a world. A phrase I repeat a lot is "talk or die." Uh, uh, well, uh, one, one, one can think of gen the genocide as a great silence. Uh, and my mother's talk, I say, is her way of saying never again. It's her filling the world, being, being present, uh, you know, demanding recognition. Um, uh, my father, so the, the, the first chapter is a reflection on that. The second chapter is about my, more about my father. My father's a product of depression. Um, uh, and, and, uh, uh, which forms a, 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 a vision of the world as supremely unjust, right? Why was he suffering? He was a brilliant man, a brilliant child, the best in his class and everything, uh, yet in constant need, dependent on others. Uh, his father died when he was two, his, his mother and he were cast on, on the, the uh, charity of the relatives. Uh, this this uh, creates in him the enduring wisdom I refer to a few times in the book that, that he wanted to pass on to his son, uh, uh, which uh, was one sense, all right? In this world, there are the fuckers and the fuckies. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> there is a glimmer of New York socialism in that expression. <laughs> um, uh, but this was his permanent attitude. And at my mother's confession, he knew one thing for certain. One thing for certain, he was then and would forever be a puppy. Uh, and, um, uh, and, and, and that in part is the, the, the rage. But, but my father is also a product of the Second World War. Um, uh, uh, my father fights, well, he's a medic, but he's with Patton's army. Uh, and I think about in this book, um, all of the endless death and destruction this man saw. And, and he comes back from the war profoundly changed, uh, profoundly in flight. And flight from his own death. Uh, and, and this shapes him uh, tremendously. I, I say at one point in the book that my father's uh, day job was raging at the injustice of the world, and his night job was uh, insomnia, cold sweats, uh, and a suffering angst at the thought of his own death. Um, 
So this is a man who was moving in perilous waters uh, day, day and night. Um, uh, so that too is a reflection on, on, on the terrible construction that nature of the 20th uh, century and what, what it did to people. Uh, so we have truth and memory. Uh, and then the second half of the book about death and ritual slash faith it, it is, about, is about the, the uh, possibilities of religion. Uh, in the 20th century, or, or rather than say religion, I should say the sacred. Where can we find faith? Where can we find meaning? Um, uh, and uh, this I track and think about as my family moves through, you know, these, these moments that used to be marked and moderated by ritual. How do you deal with the dead body? There's a scene where I'm in the hospice and my mother's body is wheeled in front of me. What do I do? What am I supposed to do? Um, uh, how do you dispose of, uh, of the... Uh, you know, uh, uh, of the ashes. Uh, uh, what's a ritual look like uh, when it has to be invented? Um, so the second half of the book is about uh, our secular age. Uh, and that's the sense in which the book is really about the, the history of the 20th century. All right, I could go on. Uh, it, it, it is a book uh, as well. Um, it, it crosses genre, it's philosophy, it's, it's uh, 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 memoir. Um, uh, uh, many many people refer to it as my novel, uh, and there are great elements of the novel uh, uh, because uh, it, many uh, things that I'm writing about uh, I'm inventing. I don't really know my father's history. I don't know what it was like, you know, yeah, for him in the depression. I, I, I'm, I'm, more, I'm I'm creating a character, uh, and the same with my mother. What do I? I don't know anything about her, her, her life, life in Germany. Um, uh, and for me, uh, let me finish with two, two thoughts. One, um, the most difficult part of this book compared to all the other books I've written um, and the real challenge, which I enjoyed, but the real challenge, which I, I failed at many times in the earlier drafts is um, the, the book um, required the construction of the narrator. Um, that is, I had to construct my narrative voice in a way that the reader would trust me. Uh, and and that, was, that, that was a challenge. I'm a figure in this book as the, the narrator. Uh, uh, and and uh, so that was a literary uh, uh, a challenge. Uh, and then the, the book is also, uh, you know, uh, uh, what should I say here? The, the book is an exercise in the writer's craft. Uh, every, every sentence in the book is, is deeply constructed and a lot of people comment on, uh, uh, on this. Um, so I wanted to write, you know, um, you know, I'm exaggerating to say, I wanted to write a beautiful book. Uh, and I wanted to write a beautiful book uh, in the sense of commemorating the characters in the book, being respectful of them, preserving them. Um, and uh, so, so that put a high demand uh, uh, on me. And I have no idea if I succeeded. Uh, anyway, I'll, that's, that's enough. I'll, I'll stop there. Um, yeah. Um, like a couple of comments about the well, you might say this superficial storyline, and, and then we'll get into the, the deeper. One thing that really struck me, and this is my second read through in preparation for this, I'll say I, I got the book when it came out, I read it, and we were uh, visited over the summer by a friend who's a psychologist. And I said, I have a book you have to read, and I gave it to her. So when uh, Jason invited me to do this talk, I said, I need a copy of the book. And, that, and that's why. Uh, so I, I, I knew, as I went through the second time, I knew the story line. Uh, and, and one thing that I found very interesting as a narrative choice is that you say at the very beginning, my mother confessed to him having had, my mother, my mother made a confession. And we, you said in your presentation, you say in the beginning that it was a confession to an affair. Actually, not quite. It's not till page 18, and those are very dense, emotionally packed pages that we know what it was that she confessed to. We never know exactly, we never learn exactly what she confessed to. She had a sexual affair with somebody, not her husband. We never know who it was. We never know how long it lasted. We never know the circumstances under which it started or ended or what they did sexually. When, to another, so that's- The limits to my fictional ability. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, it's, it's worse than that, really, because uh, I comment uh, early, early on, maybe after page 18, that uh, 
She confesses at 75 when her memory was already strained. Uh, I was never sure it happened. Um, I, I mean, here's this monumental eruption in their lives. It may have been about fiction. Um, uh, and it had the characteristics of some of her fictions that I knew she created. There were no witnesses. The guy, whoever it was, I mean, I know who it was. I don't really know. I just know. Uh, uh, he's dead. He's been dead a very long time. No one else had heard anything about it. Um, uh, uh, so um, what would it mean if it, it were a, a fiction? What is actually truth? And here's the point at which the characters in the book are dealing with the same problem I'm dealing with. Right? They're constructing their history and trying to uh, figure out what's true, uh, just as I am. Uh, so yeah, we don't, we, don't, we don't know much and, and um, yeah. yeah. Well, and of course, the, you know, the deeper meaning of the book, you don't need to know those facts, but just as narrative, it's quite interesting uh, right, right. that you don't. And, and my other comment on, on, on this level is you, you said in a way it's a book about the history of the 20th century, but you didn't mention the 60s in the way you just said. Yeah. And it's very much about the 60s because it was in the 60s that this happened. Well, two things happened in the 60s, if I read your family history correctly. Your father gave up uh, the job that he never liked and considered drudgery working for other people. He was a lawyer. Up, <laughs> so, he took a nice suburban life without consulting your mother and moved to the shores of the Chesapeake Bay and opened a marina, a, 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 boat, a boat business, just like out of the blue. And your mother is wrenched out of her nice suburban lawyer's wife life and finds herself, you know, in the middle of nowhere running a boat business. So, so that, and, and, and so was this a, the kind of, self-actualization that the 60s told us we should, we were entitled to. Right. We were, you know, he, he, had, he had fought in the war and, and, and right. there's a lot here about that he obviously suffered from a, a, a very acute and chronic and undiagnosed PTSD from his war. So he, he paid all those dues and then the 60s arrive and he's gonna do what he's gonna do. Never tells your mother. And your mother, on the other hand, she said, okay, he did this to me. And where's my self-actualization? Well, she has an affair. So the, the 60s are kind of a, you know, present. And you, you, in your first person interpolations, talk about your own self in the 60s, where your parents were beginning to wonder whether you were ever going to, like, get a job, right? Your hair was too long, you know, tracing around Europe. And you were was, right about that. <laughs> what was going to become of you? So, so those are my, you know, kind of, as I say, rather superficial. No, no, I, I do think that's right, although the 60s is a complicated point for me because um, I take up the problem of the 60s because I do think the idea of authenticity that emerges from the 60s is, is and was for them a very destructive idea. Um, truth over care, uh, I, I, I describe it as um, pre-sex pre, pre gets uh, substituted for, for love. Uh, and um, so it's the 60s, I say, that do them in, in some ways. Uh, uh, because each, as, as Linda says, the remark go, goes off on their own uh, path of, uh, self-expression. They, they just go like, like this. And, and of course, as they go like this, the family goes like this, <laughs> right? Yeah. So, so there's, a, there's a reflection on what does it mean? You know, what, is, what did the 60s mean for families? Uh, as, uh, and, and there's this reflection, as, as you say, on, on myself, where I think, you know, I'm old enough to think of myself as a product of the 60s, but as I write the book, I realize I'm not a product of the 60s. Their product of the 60s, yeah. because but who am I? You know, I was just a teenager. <laughs> you know, uh, I, had, I had nothing to give up, uh, and um, I said that's all right. Um, but uh, and and it's and it's a theme. But but you know, I, it's not. I, I don't want to say it's a book about this. That, that that's the set of conditions or circumstances under which these deeper themes can be worked out. Because the pathologies that I'm describing are much deeper. I'm, oh, I, you know, yeah. much much deeper. I mean, the '60s didn't give my father PTSD. You know, uh, 
the 60s made it possible for him to react in certain ways uh, uh, to, to, to that. And the same with my, my, my mother, you know, the 60s versus Hitler. Well, Hitler's in some ways a lot more important in the construction of my mother's life. But the 60s give that a, a kind of a shape. Uh, so, so yeah, the 60s is, is a part of the story. Uh, and, um, and that's an important part of the story. Uh, so on, on, on the deeper level, as you said, I mean, it's a book about, about truth and love. It challenges the kind of, you know, pablum of the truth shall set you free. In fact, the truth is what, if it was true, let's assume, assuming arguendo that it was true, that she did have an affair. It, it kind of reminded me of the Eugene O'Neill, uh, The Iceman Cometh and the character of Hickey, where, you know, he's got to tell everybody the truth and it destroys the, you know, I, I, it's a long time since I've seen it, but as I recall, that was a very startling notion to me when as a teenager, I, oh, really, truth is not always the best policy. Uh, and your reflections on love and hate and the relationship between love and hate and what one gives up in a loving relationship, you, you say it's, it's autonomy. It's a kind of a freedom that you give up in becoming back in the platonic whole um, that you that you refer to. So you've got a couple of lines that I wrote down early in the book because they're uh, they they tell us what's they, they signal what's coming. I think I'll read two of these lines. You say, if we are to make any sense of our lives, we must understand that the sources of evil in the human heart are exactly the same as the sources of love. And you say. All that is of lasting significance occurs at the extremes. There, we learn who we are. So I just ask you to reflect on those two sentences and elaborate a bit on them. Yeah, well, this is a good point to make another place to make another point because um, I think you would find very similar sentences in my works on political theory. Uh, and um, uh, so, um, um, you know, let's think about the first one. Uh, the sources of love and the sources of evil uh, are exactly the same. I, I think I wrote two books on that already. Okay. <laughs> but say more though. Say but, more. Uh, but 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 think about the state. You know, and our relationship to the state. The state state um, is the object of our our care and our commitment. Um, the state exists. Uh, in, in, existentially through the willingness of people to sacrifice for the state. Um, this is a part of my larger political theory that the foundation of the state is sacrifice, not contract. Um, but what is the state? You know, the, the state is the largest and most successful instrument of murder that's ever been created. Uh, so, so we have this very difficult relationship between the state as the object of our existential affirmation, our identity, who it is. We're bound to the state. We see, we see the, the power, the love of the state in Ukraine today. Uh, but we see the evil of the state uh, you know, in, in, in Russia. And, and of course, Russia is not just aberrational. You know, think about the United States not so long ago in, in, in uh, Iraq. So, so when we think about you know, our commitment uh, to the state, or you know, think, think about the the ambiguity of the soldier, who's both a, a, an affirmation of his, the love of the state and his defense of the state, and what is he doing? He's killing people. Uh, and uh, so, so this difficulty works at the micro level and the macro level. And in this book, it's just, look, uh, really to hate, you really have to care. I, I mean, my, my father sets off on this torturous response, relationship to her, because she is his all. <laughs> You know, that's all they have in the world, the two of them. You know, they're, I, I, I frequently use the images you were suggesting that Plato's circle men, you know, bound together, <laughs> bound together. Uh, and they, they remain bound together throughout this. Um, uh, and so the sense of, of um, being absolutely dependent on, committed to, affirming, and then the, the, the response of, of, of uh, in, to, to, to disappointment and justice. 
uh, uh, triggers monstrous evil. So think about King Lear, you know, and his relationship to Cordelia. This, the, 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 this, this book is most similar to a book I wrote when I was quite young, a book about King Lear. Uh, and it, it too is about love and evil. Um, so yes, I think, and, and you know, think about family. So this, the center, you know, this is a, a whole profession of psychoanalysis you know, uh, out of this. So the, the whole ambiguity of the family is it's the center of the, the, our deepest love and our, our, our deepest experiences of the pathological side of, of uh, human nature. So I think this theme is running throughout. And, um, and, and one part of the book that we haven't talked about at all, um, it, and in some ways, you know, this is all very personal, but there's an even more personal side of this book, which I summarized in one point. There are various images of me with my children, which I say, I will not be my father's son. Uh, so there's a, a contrast running through the book of, um, you know, my parents and my family, and then what I imagine from my children and my relationship to them and, and the struggle. Uh, 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 you you have an image of yourself sitting up night after night after night with your, I guess, colicky yeah. little baby um, and thinking consciously, this is a privilege. And it's one that your father was never able to right. appreciate. Not only not able to appreciate, he almost killed me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, at a central point in the book when I'm eight years old uh, 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 over, uh, in, a, in a similar set of circumstances. So yeah. well, um, he didn't kill you, but he, let you know that he, he didn't want to hear your problems in the middle of the night. In the middle of the night, it was the first appendix. Right. And, yeah. All right. Uh, so the notion of confession, um, and well, the, the nexus maybe between confession and, and psychoanalysis, because the book is not kind to the profession of Cycle. You should see the first draft. <laughs> <laughs> because your mother's confession came out of her therapy, where her therapist said, you know, just let it all out. You're 75 years old, you know, let it all out, talk it out. This is something that's been in your couple's you know, therapy. You know, at couple and and you know, it'll be fine. You'll you can, you know, you'll you'll go into the last phase of your joint lives with everything out on the table and and it'll it'll just be you feel so much better now as you say it could, to to confess something to someone is to can be a very self-indulgent thing that makes a demand on the other person for some kind of response and that was the dynamic here so uh you know, probably most of us have been in therapy at some time in our lives. I think that's pretty universal experience in the population that we're all in. And and so, like, what about that? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I, I do think again, this is this is kind of like the '60s that the therapy is the condition under which this occurs, but it's not the explanation. It's just um, what 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 was the sequence of events that sort of brought her to to this um, made it possible. And, and, and so um, I do think that, you know, in, in, the, 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 in some ways she was following a, a psychiatric protocol. Here are the things you have to do. And, and also, as you say, this is a part of that protocol is nothing is unforgivable. Right. We understand it, we forgive it. Right. And that course was like right. totally wrong in this right. case. Right, and, and you know, um, um, there is something liberating about speaking the truth. You shouldn't have to hide yourself. You should, you know, you should be authentically yourself. And his responsibility is to accept that uh, and work with that. And, and if you can't, well, there's other therapists involved that can help, <laughs> right? And as I say, and, uh, you, you know, I, as I describe this reasoning and how, you know, it was inconceivable, I'm sure, to this, this therapist that, you know, the response of my father would be murder, you know, literally murderous. Uh, she had a, probably a protocol again for, you know, how to get her straining work, right? uh, as if that was the answer. Uh, and um, uh, so I think the whole thing was beyond the imagination of, uh, of uh, uh, 
uh, you know, I don't want to condemn all psychologists. I'm sure there, there are some out there that would, would have been, you know, would, would have heard the story and said to her, you know, the last thing you should do <laughs> is tell the truth to, to, to this guy. Uh, and, um, but, this, but, but this one didn't. Uh, and um, so encouraged her to, you know, to, to live honestly and to ask him to accept it. It is, you know, in, in some ways, you know, there, there's another theme of the book. It's kind of a, a, a more difficult theme, but, but it runs and through and it comes out at various, various moments. That, that what, what I call the, the, the intersection of comedy and tragedy. Uh, the book is a tragedy, right? But, but there are moments where tragedy becomes comedy. So the idea that, you know, these two old people, he's 83 years old and she's 75 years old, the idea that they're going to rend the world you know, in a, a, a disruption of murderous intent over an affair that may or may not have happened 35 years ago with a guy who's dead, <laughs> right? I, I mean, it takes some imagination <laughs> to, to think that this could be so disruptive, but it is. Uh, it is endlessly uh, 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 disruptive. So, so I think she got some reassurance and bad advice, um, you know, uh, and... Um, uh, and he, 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 well, this is another part of his, he, my uh, chapter two reflections on, on PTSD, among other things. Um, he won't see doctors. Um, mm -hmm. Why won't he see doctors? Well, doctors remind him of death. Um, to, to be, to present yourself to a doctor is to present the, the living body for observation. He can't stand being observed, right? Which leads over into, he has, you know, he can't stand authority can't stand any of that. So, so the idea that, you know, the two of them can come into couples therapy, I say, this is as imaginable as, you know, as him going out and playing golf, or joining the bridge club. You know, this is, this is a man who was exploding, you know, filled the room, um, but was, was in some way, you know, you know, an existential presence. Everybody else was an idiot. Uh, and, and to get back to another point that I didn't make before about how should we read this book? Um, you're not far off if you think my father is an image of the state, uh, is an image of the state. Many people read the book as an allegory about politics. Uh, and, and my father is the, you know, the, 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 the absolute affirmation of his own existence as the, 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 the necessary condition of any meaning in life at all. Refusal to die, endless, uh, en endless affirmation and the endless demand for justice. Right? You offend me, and it's, it's um, you know, the vengeance all the way. And, and my mother is, you know, also the state, but she's the state in its caring aspect, you know? And so there's this huge competition between them. You know, you might say, well, what is a family? But it's the same questions. What is a state? You know, is it, you know, an endless uh, self-exertion under an ideal of justice? Or is it care? Is it concern? Uh, and um, uh, and uh, so they're they're playing. Well, I'll say one more thing. They're playing on a very deep field that they don't really understand, and that's my role to try and explain what the patterns of their life amount to. And one of the themes I, I come to very early is uh, you can't understand what they're doing without understanding, you know, the the, the, the deep way in which uh, Western religion has shaped our imaginations. These are completely secular people, but they're finding their way in the most traditional forms of religious life. Confession, right? Repentance, forgiveness. Uh, you know, uh, these are, uh, as I say, these, these forms of living are bred in the bone. It doesn't matter, um, uh, you know, whether you believe in God or not. These are the ways people uh, organize and imagine uh, of what's going on in, in their lives. And, and, and there is a, there's a shocking moment. We haven't talked much about the end of the book. There's a very shocking moment uh, at the, the made up ritual that we have for my mother's, um, what you call it, not a funeral, <coughs> disposal of the ashes, remains. Right. Very complicated problem, you know? You know, go to this place that looks like a strip mall where they hand you your mother in a box. Uh, and uh, and uh, uh, so what do you do with the ashes? Uh, how, do you, how do you create a ritual? Uh, because something needs to be done or they sit on the mantle you know, forever. Um, 
And, and so I described the way this is negotiated and thought about and the difficulties of all of this. And, and, um, and then my father has <coughs> to say something. And it's just, you know, again, tragedy becomes comedy. What is this man? We're all looking at him. We all want to say, Jacques Hughes, you know, what you've done is un unforgivable. You have to be held to account. But we're all scared. We're all just too, we just, we just want to go home and be done with all of, of this. So, but we're all wondering, what is he going to say at this point? Is it going to be the moment at which he says, you know, um, I'm sorry. You know, I'm sorry. What I've done is un unforgivable. And, and, and of course, he answers, no. But what does he do? Um, he hands my uncle, who's there, two poems to read that were of significance uh, in his life. In some way, he doesn't explain. So no explanation at all. And these two poems, there's about 10 of us standing there by the river, are in German, which none of us understand. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> perfect metaphor. For this. Right, right, you know, truth. Yeah. <laughs> what is it? Uh, and, and, and then he goes on and he says the most remarkable thing. He says, you know, I always thought, he says, so my relationship to your mother is as one of doing penance. Penance. I was doing penance. Here's a man who spent five years torturing her. And he says, this, my relationship was one of penance. And then I struggled trying to understand what could he possibly have been thinking of meant by uh, uh, this. And, and the answer, not, the answer is complicated, but the answer is he's moving down. This is a man who's you know, a secular Jew who's really an atheist. He's modeling himself on Christ. You know, uh, this is sacrifice for the suffering of mankind. Uh, and, and I'm thinking, oh my God. <laughs> but, but that's the way in which, you know, these forms of meaning are completely bred in the bone. Uh, you know, you can't, you can't get away from, uh, 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 from them. So it's an extraordinary moment uh, and, <clears throat> you know, deeply puzzling. We probably have to wrap it up in less. Um, somebody who's read the book would like to Why not? say <laughs> something or yeah, and, and speak up so that everybody sure. can. You opened the door a second ago to a comparison between your father and Lear. I wonder if you might say more about that. Yeah, so my father's Lear without recovery on the, the fields of Dover. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when Lear says to Cordelia, you know, who offends him by saying nothing, right? Um, and that's her struggle with speech. How do I put into words my sense when you're, you're trying me? You, know, you, you want me to to uh, say what, what's beyond speech. So she says nothing. Uh, and his reaction is, you know, out of my sight. Um, and um, my father's reaction is, you'll never get out of my sight. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm going to torture you to the end of, end of your days. But it's the same reaction of, of hate, of disregard, of profound, um, uh, um, what should we say, profound disturbance, um, uh, which comes from this disturbance of love, back to love, love and hate. You know, the person we're most invested in is the person who's disappointed us most. So Lear, the, you know, Lear, Lear has a different line of completion, and it's the right line of completion, that there must be reconciliation at the end. And he has to go through madness to come to that. Well, my father goes mad. I mean, he's literally the whole center of the book. My father's mad. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that goes back to me. Well, what's my obligation when my father's mad? And, and the last chapter, the, the coda, the coda describes my father ending up in a psychiatric, geriatric psychiatric facility, which literally kills him. Talk about anger at psychiatrists. Right? This, this is the, the, the most institutionally, the, the worst thing I've ever seen, the absolute worst thing of anything, beginning with my father being committed. Uh, and when I leave him overnight in the emergency room, right, thinking I'm going to come back and deal with it in the morning, I get there, and he's been committed without anybody asking me, got the medical power of attorney, and against his consent. And now he's legally committed in a place that um, offers no treatment. Uh, and it drives him insane very, very quickly. Uh, and, um, 
Uh, so uh, that's another story uh, in, in, in the code. That's a different story. Which is that, yeah, but I mean, as you said earlier, you can you can debate whether the right decision was to have the coda or not. Narratively, it is an abrupt interruption, but because of these deeper themes, I think it was a good choice to have it. So yeah, so my father reaches no reconciliation um, uh, uh, as uh, Lear does, but, but of course, Lear to reach the reconciliation has to die, and this is life. Uh, so, so she dies, he doesn't. And, uh, and, uh, uh, but they're, they're playing on the same field, for, you know, we need to talk, uh, uh, it, it, it seems to me. Um, so, um, so yeah, I, I think there's much to be written about uh, about the relationship between Lear and my father. I think we could take just one more question. I, I thought that was a question. Yeah, Jim. I sort of have two. I have one thing, Bob. I, I read your draft I don't know, 14 years ago. I haven't read the book yet. But, you know, I, I, in some ways, two points. One, I have more sympathy for your father and mother because you think about sacrifice, I think a lot about trust. And I always feel like the hardest thing for a person to overcome is a betrayal of trust. And that's what your father experienced. And I've also always wondered if he was enraged, enraged by the affair, or enraged by her keeping it from him for 30 years and living with her in trust without knowing that it had been broken. But my question is about the personal and historical. And it comes partly from parallels between your father and my father and then the point at which they diverge. So you know, when you sort of view this as a 20th century story, I wonder how much of that is you imposing your world view in the 20th century um, or how much of it is explanatory. So my father was, his mother died at three. He was shipped off to live with the grandmother in poverty. Father more or less disappeared. Um, and I've said this about him often, it's the sort of childhood that can make a person bitter, you know, often would. But my father was like this almost uninformed model of love. Um, it wasn't for, because somebody had told him this is the way, it's just the way he was. And so I, I kind of wonder if it's explanatory based on a, an individual story, and I have this individual counter story, what does it really tell us about the 20th century? Or is it something else about your father and uh, maybe his parents or something? Um, yeah, yeah. I, think, I, think that, I, I think that's got to be correct. I, I, I mean, when we talk about, you know, when we talk about the meaning of the 20th century, <coughs> of course we can't be talking about everything. It's just, it's just impossible. There's huge variation. And I, and I reflect at various points in the book about this, about how, you know, there was nothing about my father's being cast into poverty at, you know, two or three or four or whatever, whatever it was. It necessarily determined this out. It can't be right. Lots of children deal with adversity and they think it's a great adventure and they come out fine. Lots and lots of them. Uh, uh, so so it, it's not just, oh, it was the 20th century and this happened. It, it, it absolutely has to do with the structure of his family. Uh, and the way they all reacted to that, uh, and um, uh, and you know, and I, I talk about him being the only male in a group of older women, and, and and all of this is complicated, right? Uh, but the answer can't be well, we can just ignore the 20th century or ignore this. It has to be well, this is one of the possible lines of development that understands making sense in this context. Well, it's not determined. But, you know, if it was determined, it would be nothing interesting. I mean, all we would do is have to track the Hegelian spirit, spirit, you know, as it rolled through history instead of actually talking about individuals. You know, um, and that's you know, that's why we write novels, memoirs instead of abstract uh, history. So, so I completely agree with that. On, on trust, yeah, I think that's complicated. Um, um, there's something to it, but you know, I really have to think long and hard about it because. Because um, my father didn't present himself as a person who trusted others. He demanded, you know, uh, and uh, he had expectations. You know, he, he suffered from a failure of recognition. And, and well, that's something I talk a lot, lot in the book about my mother's demand for recognition. 
trust without recognition is just really trust. You know, it's it's power. Uh, and surely there's a lot of that, a lot of patriarchal, patriarchal power running through all of this. And and so the 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 betrayal of trust is an attack on the power. Uh, and um, uh, so, so there's something about trust, but but it, but it, but it's not a virtuous trust. Um, uh, and I should say, look, you know, I, I I don't. Some people respond to the book and think, well, it's you know, just your hatred of the father is too strong here. But um, I I don't feel that. You know, I feel like I'm trying to give a sympathetic portrayal of man. I think I think he genuinely suffered, uh, really suffered. And I think my 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 mother was equally matched with him in this endless battle. She wasn't only the victim. Um, so, the, you know, and at some point I say, you know, his pain was greater than her pain uh, in, in all of this, just as a, a, an experience. So, so, but, uh, so, but, but she was mistaken and he was evil. So that has to be, you know, part of the equation uh, at, at, as well. Um, she didn't set off to have him suffer, but he did. Uh, so, Anyway, thanks for coming. <laughs>